Good evening and welcome to the Bible study here in Ballyclare Evangelical Presbyterian Church. And if you're able to join with us this evening across the internet, that is a matter of great joy and delight to us. We trust that you'll know something of God speaking to your heart and having dealings with you. We need his blessing if that's to be the case, so let's pray for that blessing now. Our Father, our God in heaven, we own that without your blessing, without your grace, without your intervention, without your dealings, our meeting together is completely and utterly in vain. We need that God would deal with us. We need that God would speak to us. We need that we might draw near to God and God would draw near to us. Remember us, we pray, out of your wonderful mercies and have dealings with our hearts for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we have been looking in the Old Testament and following a little series that has to do with um, God's dealings with the people of Israel, their history, really. We're not looking at every um, little detail. We couldn't possibly do that, um, but not in the time that we have, but um, it's more of an overview. It's trying to get something of a handle on where this history um, is going and how God deals with his people. We come this evening to the first book of Samuel. I'm going to read from chapter one. It's the story of Hannah. Now, there was a certain man of <clears throat> Ramathaim, Zophim of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephraimite. <clears throat> and he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice and the Lord of hosts, um, to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I had drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaints and grief I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favour in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Then they arose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord, and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked for him from the Lord. Well, it's a wonderful story. It'll lead us on into Samuel and so on. Let's turn to God and seek his face together now in prayer. Our Father of God in heaven, we thank you that we can draw near to you in this very simple way. We thank you that we don't need to approach with great, long sounding or eloquent words. We Thank you that we don't need to shout nor scream nor to raise our voices, but rather that we come with humble and lowly hearts and sensing our need and persuaded, convinced that without you we're lost 
we're in great trouble. And oh, that we would sense our need. Come to us in the power of your Holy Spirit this night. And as we seek together to open your holy word, we pray that it would convince us again of our need. We live in such an arrogant day when men's hearts are so full, when men want to speak in a boastful way and to think of themselves so well. But your word has come to us. You have convinced us, O oh God, that we're sinners. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, your word says. And wonderfully, in the power of your Holy Spirit, we've been brought to hear that word, to know its truth, to believe upon it, and then to see the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for bringing us to a sense of our wrong and our guilt and sin and shame through your holy law. And Father in heaven, we acknowledge to you there this evening that we fail you, and it's a million times over. We grieve you and we hurt you. We're prone, Lord, to think highly of our selves to trust in our our own merit even as the people of god we're prone to do that we're prone oh god to want to look well before others and it becomes of lesser concern how we appear before god but we thank you that you're a gracious god and so help us lord bring us back to the pathways of truthfulness and thereby to the pathways of righteousness Help us, Lord, to be honest and truthful before God with ourselves. Help us, Lord, to sense our need of you again tonight. We pray your blessing upon us here in Bible study and in our prayer to follow. We pray that your hand would be upon us for good in our individual lives. There are different things going on there. Um, some, oh God, in the midst of a very busy week, some with medical issues, um, some, Lord, really up against it in terms of health we commend all to you they need you they need your grace they need your help they need your blessing lord come to them we pray and do them each and individually good and whatever our need this week we pray that you would help us and lift us up that you would give us the the, the joy of the lord to be our strength keep us lord we pray from being overwhelmed with the difficulty of the way and rather give us that um, heart that is able to rejoice rejoice and be glad the savior has come what a wonderful um, reason to be glad we have keep us uh, looking um, to that wonderful truth help us to sound his praises we ask you and to rejoice in your grace and love day by day by day we do pray that you would remember us our children and children's children have dealings, O oh God, we pray, with our little ones. And Lord, we crave of you to make them yours, as only you can. Come down to them, O oh God, and bless them and remember them, we pray. We ask you that you would um, give us, Heavenly Father, uh, a, a new uh, sense of needing you, a new desire to glorify you, um, a new longing, O oh God, that in our lives, we might set forth something of the light and glory of God. May it be, Lord, that people round and about us will uh, sense that we hold back from man and we trust in God. Such a day of man pushing himself forward. But Lord, keep us, we pray, in that knowledge of our complete and total need of you. Help us to walk in the fear of God. God help us to hold back from man and to put all our hope and trust in God and may it be that walking in that fear of God that men and women boys and girls round and about us will know will sense there's something something that they need an answer may they sense that truth we pray we ask you for our sister congregations that you would bless them especially those that meet for prayer this evening do them good we pray that you would be pleased to remember um, great needs that are in the midst of our denomination at the moment and for, for those who are sad for those who are worried for those who are bewildered we commend them all to your hand to your grace and to your love and we pray heavenly father that in these um, difficult situations that we might find our answer not in man whose breath is in his nostrils but we might find our answer in God. So hear our prayer. Come to us and bless us, we ask, 
and God's people throughout the world for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Well, we have um, launched out into this series. It's to do with the history of the children of Israel. We are tracing it um, through the Old Testament. We've seen it in Moses that God remembered his people, the promise that he'd made to them. We've seen how he delivered them through the Red Sea, how he gave them that wonderful picture um, in the, 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 the wonder, really, of um, the, 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 the lamb that was provided um, there for them, the Passover lamb. We've seen how God's people were grateful, but it didn't last too long. We've seen how they got so many things wrong, and we've seen that God took their failure very seriously. That's a solemn warning to us. At the same time, we've seen how wonderfully gracious God was. And you can see that during the lifetime of Moses, God um, is long suffering, but you can see it perhaps especially when Joshua comes and God gives that new generation, as it were, a second chance, a second chance to enter into the promised land to cross the river Jordan in full flood, a second chance with the book of Deuteronomy to hear his word again. And God was with Joshua. And um, there's the story of Jericho. There's that warning story of Ai, but God was with them. We come to Judges. And in the book of Judges, whilst there's a good start, ungodliness soon prevails. And the people turn again and again to idolatry. God raises up a judge. We looked at some of the pictures, not in too much detail, but wonderfully how those pictures, and we did look at this in some detail, picture the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we come to the one final judge who really is Samuel and the story of Hannah. It's a wonderful story. Three headings, godliness, standing firm. We'll look at Hannah, godliness, standing firm. Grace gifted from God. We'll see the appearance of Samuel. He's a gift from God. God's wrath revealed. And we'll see that sadly and tragically, the message that Samuel in his very young days brings comes to fulfillment and God's wrath is indeed revealed. Those three headings then. First of all, godliness standing firm. Now we've highlighted um, the period of the judges and um, there are many ups and downs in that period. And we saw last time, um, it's almost like an appendix really to the book of Judges, the book of Ruth. And how Boaz then um, was also a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. So those judges are sent and they're far from perfect. Their imperfections are clear. Um, but they are veiled pictures of the one ultimately that God would send, the perfect one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Boaz, in a similar way, um, stands in and becomes the kinsman redeemer. That lovely language for Ruth. Um, without the intervention of a kinsman redeemer, she, she was lost really. She was in trouble. But God um, has this man ready. And we saw that through the family then um, that is raised within their household will ultimately come the Lord Jesus Christ. A wonderful um, story there and wonderfully encouraging to us. Now, we turn this evening um, to the story of Samuel. And we're going to come to yet another account of God raising someone up, a judge. In this case, Samuel. And to help and he's going to be a wonderful help. And again, uh, we're not pretending for a moment that Samuel is perfect. We, we couldn't do that. But it, it does picture for us the goodness, the grace, the gentleness of God. And all really prefiguring the sending forth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ultimately, all of the Bible is pointing um, to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not that we forget the truth of what happened when it happened and learn from that, but ultimately it does point to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it reminds us what an amazing God we have. Now, let's notice this evening the part played by Hannah in all this. This little series is an overview of the history of the people of Israel, but time and again, um, in that history, it's the individual that is important. And that's why we've um, used that heading this evening, Godliness Standing Firm. And the individual, the part that Hannah plays, and that happens time and again. And so, you know, we've talked about Moses, we've talked about Joshua, the part that they played. And you can go through the Old Testament and there's person after person and the stand that they took, the part that they played. Um, Daniel, of course, will be an outstanding example of this. 
And we sometimes sing with the children, don't we, the, the little chorus, dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Daniel stood for God. And through his standing for God, well, he brought blessing to God's people in his day, but he brings blessing to us. In the same way, Hannah, in the same way, Hannah. Um, she's going to, to take a, a godly stand. She's going to dare to stand alone. Not in the same way as Daniel, but by the godliness of her life. Now, don't misunderstand, because I'm not seeking by making this emphasis on the sort of loneliness of this lady. I'm not suggesting that we seek to be aloof, not for a moment. Um, God's people are intended to be together in so far that that is possible. I'm certainly not um, suggesting <coughs> that we become loners or hermits or anything like that in the Christian life. Certainly not. Um, we know that God, we actually touched on this on Sunday morning, we, we know that God is three persons. We uh, read of the Lord Jesus Christ that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was before God. And um, we have described there this interrelationship between the persons of the Godhead. And so that when man is made in the image and likeness of God, very quickly woman is made for man. And there's society, and there's a togetherness. But so often, when we read the pages of Scripture, um, it's the individual standing firm for God that counts. And you certainly see that in, in this um, lady, Hannah. In life, um, perhaps there can be a reluctance to stand out on your own. You certainly see that with young people, don't you? And they want to be in a group, and there are group norms and so on, and they want to be together in a group. And they're scared not to be in the group, and they're, they're scared to upset the group and so on, or to be different. And it's, it's young people, but you can actually have that right across the age range. And people are afraid almost to, to do things on their, their own. They have to keep in. Um, think of the book of Proverbs. It's a very stark warning in the book of Proverbs. Um, and it needs to be understood. It's there, uh, written primarily for young people. And we read there these words, chapter 1 of Proverbs. My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in your lot among us. Let us have one purse. Let's be together in this, you see. Let's have our money together. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path, for, they run, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood, and so on. And that's right at the start of the book of Proverbs. And it's this warning, young people, don't get dragged in. And how many times have we seen that sort of thing happen? Timothy is told, a um, very important passage this, but Timothy is told his ministry, he is to look after his own heart, he's to be careful with God's word in his heart. And then he's told this, he says, let no one despise your youth, 1 Timothy 4, verse 12, but be an example to the believers in word conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things, give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Timothy was to be careful. He was to set an example, but he was to be careful, if you like, to keep the home fires burning. He was to be careful that he walked with God because um, his walk with God would have an influence on others. Dare to be a Daniel. Now, it's not Daniel here, but Hannah. And so the story, um, her husband is Elkanah. He was a comparatively godly man. We're told verse 3 of chapter 1, This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. So he's a comparatively godly man. He went up. Now, understand the word comparatively. Uh, for, for God's people were supposed to go up three times a year. But in comparative terms, he was a godly man. We're told that he loved his wife, Hannah. But... He'd taken a second wife, and her name was Penina. 
This is a picture of a comparatively godly man. But pressure had told. There's a lesson. Pressure had told. Because um, Hannah was childless and he'd taken a second wife that was completely against God's law. And how difficult it made life for Hannah. The man loved her, no question about that. He would give to Hannah a double portion for he loved Hannah. But the reality, and I suppose there's a bit of an overlap here with the story of Ruth, there was a famine in the land. The reality was that her womb was closed by the Lord. Twice we're told that. And she had to bear with being childless and to being brutally mocked by Penina. It's repeated there, the Lord had closed her womb. This must have been a very, very difficult set of providences indeed. Um, and it must have been especially difficult um, when the time came to worship God and to go up to Jerusalem. And so it was year by year, verse 7, when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. The time of rejoicing but she, she didn't feel like eating. This was a very difficult time to bear. Now, try and put yourself in her shoes this evening. What a difficult providence this was. Do you feel that you, you, you've, you, your life is filled with difficult providence? That can happen. That can happen. We can feel that. This lady's life was filled with difficult providence. But notice how she responds. Verse 9. So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And she makes a vow. Even in the midst of that, she's badly misunderstood. For Eli, who ought to have had some understanding of people's difficulties, Eli gets it wrong. He rushes to a completely wrong judgment. And it happened, verse 12, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. He comes to this conclusion that the dear woman was drunk. And it was completely, you know, it was nonsense. It was complete nonsense, but that's the conclusion that he rushes to. He should never have rushed to that. You know, if we're going to rush to such, um, such nonsensical conclusions, well, how, how ridiculous is that? That can happen. It can happen amidst God's people, that. And people rush to a conclusion. They, they know nothing about the situation, but they rush to a conclusion. And they feel that they have this entitlement to do that. Well, this man makes a serious mistake. And you know what? Um, he, he was not dealing with his own problems. He's rushing to judgment about this dear lady. And there, there's awful things going on in his family. And he bore a measure of responsibility for that. And so he's busy pointing the finger, but he's not taking on board the fingers that are pointing backward here. We can only imagine how hard that was for Hannah to take. Because really, he ought to have been a source of encouragement. Um, she stands up for herself. Hannah answers verse 15. No, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I've spoken until now. And then, thankfully, Eli gets it right. Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. Only then does Eli um, get it right. The point I want to make um, is that time and again, it's individuals standing firm for God. People like, um, uh, you know, you can go uh, Old Testament, New Testament, people like Zacharias and Elizabeth, their, their circumstance was not easy. People like Joseph of Arimathea, he, he takes the body of Jesus. Jeremiah, um, you know, the weeping prophet, what a difficult work he had. Hezekiah, how he stands up for God. John the Baptist. What a difficult time John had. And um, ultimately then he loses his head and it's delivered on, on a plate. And you think, wow, God, this is difficult. Um, but so often what you and I are or are not as individuals tells a story. Your godliness or not tells a story. 
your unwillingness to run with the crowd tells a story. Your standing first, firm rather on, on God's word tells a story. On believing the Bible, on faithfulness, on service, um, on standing firm, things like the Lord's Day. That's where the rubber actually meets the road. Sometimes God's people can be full of criticism of the world. I understand that. I understand that. But if we're not going to stand firm, if we're not going to take our stand, how can we criticize the world when we have not been examples as we ought to have been? There's a crowd pressure. Even within the church, there can be a crowd pressure to conform, to fold, to do this, to do that. Hannah stood firm. And we're told, wonderfully, that God didn't forget. Verse 19, Then they arose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew his wife. And the Lord remembered her. All of this didn't go unnoticed by God. Godliness standing firm. Be godly for God. Um, if it means quitting the crowd, quit the crowd. But be godly for God. That's the first thing, godliness standing firm. But secondly then, grace. Grace gifted from God. Uh, what a lesson, godliness standing firm. But that takes us on to the birth of Samuel and the grace gifted from God. And can I say what a, a gift Samuel was? Now, all children are a gift, aren't they? And, and how, how blessed we are. Um, to have uh, children, to have children in our families, to have children in the life of the church. Psalm 127, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Well, here's a gift, and firstly a gift to, to Hannah, and how she loved that little boy. And what a treasure he was. It's hard for us to understand how, um, you know, adults can be cruel with children. But we hear of it almost every week, don't we? In different ways. And some of the things that adults are willing to do, parents flying off on their holidays and leaving little children at home, it's just unimaginable. Unimaginable. This lady um, so treasures this little lad. Now she holds back from taking him up to Jerusalem while she's still feeding him. Um, but that wasn't an excuse. And um, she's quick then to, to go up at the right time. Um, her husband says, well, you, you, you do what you, you, you think here and, and you can understand that. But we read in verse 24 of chapter one. Now, when she had weaned him, she took him up with her. Uh, she took uh, him up with her and, and three bulls, one for a flower and a skin of wine and so it brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they, they, they bring um, the, the, the offering to Eli. And she, she says to him, For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshipped the Lord there. She acknowledges God's goodness, and she keeps the vow that she had made. Now, you could come up with a thousand reasons not to keep your promise. She kept it. She kept it. That's followed. I don't have time to look at the detail of this this evening, but that's followed in chapter two. You could read that later, perhaps. Um, and you've got Hannah's wonderful prayer. All I'll say about it is that there's a godly depth to that prayer. There's an understanding. It's very clear that Hannah has grown. It's very clear that Hannah knows God, but she's thought through the, the things of God. She's made progress in her Christian life. Oh, I suppose we shouldn't use the word Christian there, but you, you understand what I'm saying. She's made progress in her walk with God. And um, she knows him. She understands so much about God and how she needs to walk with him and how God deals. This lady has learned. And um, as you look at the prayer, there are overtones there from the difficult days that she's known as childless and as the subject of such um, really hatred from Penina. It, it's amazing. Now, come back to Samuel. What a blessing um, children are and how we should delight um, in the family and in church life. 
in the children that God has given. It's important, isn't it, in church life that we take a, an interest in the, the, the children. There used to be a couple here in the church, they're dead, they're in glory now. But every time you would call with them, there'd always be this questioning over the names of the children. And they wanted to know them, they wanted to understand a little bit about them. It was really lovely and they valued and treasured the children. But we need then to pause for a moment to notice how bad things were in Israel. And that's weaved into the story here. So chapter 2, verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. And there follows a description of what they were up to. And the priest's custom was that with the people that when any offered the sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged uh, flesh hook in his hand while the meat was boiling. Then he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and the priest would take for himself all that the flesh hook, uh, flesh hook brought, brought up. So they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. They were busy cheating. That's what it amounted to. They were taking for themselves. That's what it was all about. We're told, verse 17, Therefore the sin of the young men, men was very great um, before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. This was a, a wicked thing. Not going to go into the detail there, but it was very, very wrong. And you know what? Eli knew about it. So verse 22, Now Eli was very old, and he heard everything his sons did to Israel. And how they laid with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. <laughs> it's shocking. It's absolutely shocking. Now he did remonstrate with them. Verse 23. Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons. For it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress and so on. So wicked things were going on. And in the midst of this, little Samuel. The child is growing. Verse 26 of chapter 2. And the child Samuel grew in stature and in favour, both with the Lord and men. And then, of course, the famous story, because a message comes from God. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father? When they were in Egypt, in Pharaoh's house, did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel and so on? Why do you kick at my sacrifice? Verse 29. And my offering which I have commanded in my dwelling place, and honour your sons more than me. This man knew it was wrong. He ought to have done something about it. He was in a place to do something about it, but he didn't do anything. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel, verse 30 says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. That's a verse, of course, that is important for another reason to do with Eric Little. Those that honour me, I will honour. Those who despise me should be lightly esteemed. That's the context of that verse. It's actually in the context of judgment, really. Behold, the days are coming, verse 31, that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house and so on and so forth. And um, it's the message that terrible things are going to come um, to, to Eli and to Israel. What happens next? God speaks to Samuel. And again, don't have the time really to look at this in too much detail this evening, but chapter 3. It came to pass at that time, verse 2, while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow dim, that he couldn't see. And before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and where Samuel was lying down, the Lord called to Samuel. And he says, here am I. The message is that he thinks Eli is calling, but it was God. It's repeated, it's repeated, it's repeated a third time. It's in verse 8, the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So this message is repeated, and Eli ultimately recognizes that God is speaking to the boy. And Eli says to Samuel, go lie down, and it shall be if he calls you that you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And that's what Samuel um, does. And God comes and speaks to him. Verse 10, now the Lord came and stood and called us at other times, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel answered, speak for your servant hears. And there's this message, this message. God speaks to him. Now, um, we need to understand that God hadn't been speaking. So the first verse of chapter 3. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. 
So that message came to Eli, but God wasn't really speaking. They'd been largely silenced. It was a measure of God's wrath. You might remember when Abraham went together with Hagar, very foolishly, that God didn't speak for 13 years. It was a measure of his wrath. Each evening in the Garden of Eden, it was God's design to come and speak with Adam and Eve. But here there was silence. God wasn't speaking until Samuel. Now, let me make the point. How the church should, have, should rejoice to have and should prize the Bible. How the church should rejoice to have solid, steady preaching that is clearly from God. It's a sad reflection that Christians sometimes don't seem to want that. They don't seem to want to study the Bible. They don't want to get to grips with the Bible. They don't see the need to know the Bible. And we've certainly seen that in our day and generation. And there's a wanting of something else. There's a, an appetite for the light, for the entertaining. It's other things that um, time and again seem to be prized. And the Bible is it's elbowed out. It's very, 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 very worrying. Notice the tone of the message here from verse 11. In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves violent, he did not restrain them. Notice the tone of the message. Samuel was afraid, verse 11. So Samuel lay down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Then Eli called Samuel, verse 16. Samuel, my son, he answered. And he said, what is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. And ultimately then, verse 18, Samuel told him everything. Understandably, um, you know, Samuel doesn't want to, 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 to deliver this message. It's a message of judgment. It's a very difficult message to deliver. The prophets struggled with that too at times, didn't they? And they're told, don't be afraid of the faces of men. But Samuel was to deliver the message faithfully. Remember a man many, many, many years ago, he's dead, he's in glory, been there many years. He's a preacher of God's word, preacher of God's word. And in the congregation that he served, he started to hold back. It was asked, it came to note in the congregation that when he preached elsewhere, he was his own self. But in his own congregation, he held back. They faced him with it and he said, well, it's because of your critical spirit. It's because of the way that you are. It's quite an indictment, quite an indictment to God's people. God's people can bring a famine of God's word on themselves. Godliness standing firm. Grace gifted from God. What a wonderful gift Samuel was. But God's wrath revealed. Because the message um, through Samuel is of wrath. And that wrath then comes to be revealed. Um, and so we're told, chapter 3, ver verse 18, Then Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And Eli said, It is the Lord, let him do what seems good to him. Eli had enough of God, at least, to, to realize that he was in the wrong and, and he deserved only what was coming. To his credit, at least he knew that. We read verse 19, Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. That's some verse. That's some verse. Realize that when God's word comes to us, um, if we choose to receive it, if we choose to refuse it, see what we're being told there? Let none of his words fall to the ground. What a solemn verse that is. All Israel knew that God was speaking through this young fellow. Verse 20. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Daniel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord, uh, and the word of Samuel came to all Israel. God was um, speaking through this young fellow and then notice that what God said through Samuel comes true just as it's there in chapter 3 verse 19 as we read a moment or two ago it comes true 
and how scary that should be for God's people. You know, you might write off the servant of the Lord as just a man. You say, oh, it's just a man, just a man. Um, you, you know, how scary that should be for God's people. You might write him off. You might say, oh, well, he's lost it. Um, he's full of negativity. And especially, and this is what happened in the history of Israel, um, you know, the people um, summoned uh, preachers for themselves, prophets for themselves, people who were willing to say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. There were many false prophets in Israel, many false prophets. And the people loved it. They loved it. They, my, my people loved to have it so. They loved it. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. They wanted a jolly message. They wanted a happy message. They wanted a, a message that ticked the box and said, you're good, you're good. When the truth was, they went good and things were wrong. Well, we enter the story of the battle with the Philistines. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and encamped beside Ebenezer and so on. And the Philistines come forth in battle and they, they score a wonderful victory against Israel. There's an autopsy to, um, to follow. And um, the elders of Israel said, verse 3 of chapter 4, why has the Lord defeated us today? And you know what? Instead of uh, recognizing there was sin in the camp, instead of learning the, the, the lesson that they ought to have um, learnt about Achan and so on, um, that they don't learn that lesson. And they come up with the idea, right, let's you know, roll out the ark of the Lord. Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us, that when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. And they've turned into a, you know, to, 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 to look to a clockwork God. They're turning the handle here. That's how far out of touch they are with God. That they're not recognizing that the problem here was sin. That was the problem. The problem here was wrong. Thing, wrong things were going on. Wrong things were in their midst. That's what the problem was. But they come up with the, the crazy idea of rolling out the ark of the Lord. What a lesson for God's people. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp of Israel, verse 5, they're so excited. All Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. Wow. When the Philistines heard the, the noise, I'm rushing here, but when the Philistines heard the, the noise, verse 6 and 7, they were afraid. They were afraid, and it brought fear. So the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, woe to us. I suppose that's the message that was being put out there. God is in the camp, but God wasn't in the camp. That's the problem. Their sin had separated them from God. God wasn't in the camp. But um, though that the Philistines are afraid, it stirs a resolve. And verse 8, woe to us who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods, and so on and so forth. Be strong and conduct yourselves like men, and so on. Conduct yourselves like men and fight, verse 9. So the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated and every man fled to his tent. And the ark of the Lord, verse 11, was captured. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas died. Wow. And we um, read that the, the word um, came um, of defeat. Then a man of Benjamin ran from the battle line the same day and came to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. And he comes. And when the man came to the city and told it, all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the outcry, verse 14, he said, what does the sound of this tumult mean? And the man came quickly and told Eli. Eli was 90 eight years old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see so he's struggling with his hearing he's certainly hearing from God and he's struggling with his eyes and the man said I am he who came from the battle and I fled today from the battle line what happened my son says Eli and the messenger answered Israel has fled from before the Philistines and so on and so forth also your two sons Hophni and Phinehas are dead then it happened when he made mention of the ark of God. The ark of God has been captured. When he made mention of the ark of God, that Eli fell off his seat backward and his neck was broken and he died. He judged Israel 40 years, but his neck was broken. Add to that, his daughter-in-law finished his wife. She was with child. And when she hears the, the news of the ark of the Lord being captured, her father-in-law is dead, her husband's dead. She bowed herself, she gave up birth, she gave birth rather, and her labor pains came upon her, 
And about the time of her death, the women who stood by her said, Do not fear, you've born a son. Then she named the child Ichabod. The glory has departed from Israel because the ark of the Lord had been captured. And she said, The glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. What a serious, serious message for us tonight. This is part of the Bible you might wish was not even there, but it is. It is. And it's all part of the story of the children of Israel. And God has written it down for our learning. It's there for our learning. Um, it might be cast off as distantly in the Old Testament and so on. It's part of the learning of God's word. It's bang up to date and it's relevant and how wise we need to be to learn from it. What a solemn uh, story we have here before us tonight. It shows us what happens when God's people lose touch with him and lose touch with his word. It's a very worrying feature of the day and age in which we find ourselves that there isn't the same appetite. And I know I talk about this a fair amount it's because I'm very concerned. There isn't the same appetite for God's word. God's people don't know it as well as they ought. And they don't have the appetite for it that they, they should. The appetite that was there in a previous day. How careful we need to be to know it and to heed what God says. Now there are some lovely, lovely parts to this story. Hannah. The raising up of Samuel. How gracious is God. How careful we need to be to hear God. To hear God's word preached. To support the preaching of God's word as we should how careful we need to be. Remember the indictment of this day? There was no widespread revelation. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. That's the danger that we're moving into in our day. And there, there's a lack of appetite and there's a coming shallowness in the presentation of God's word. How concerned that we should be. But Samuel, Master, speak, your servant heareth. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for your holy word. It is truly wonderful. Forgive us that we don't know it as we ought, and we don't seem at times to have the appetite for it that we should. Help us, we pray, that we might hear. Hannah heard, and she acted upon what she knew of God, and what uh, a wonderful knowledge of God she had. Samuel came to know the Lord. He listened, he heard, and he walked with God. But others there, Lord, and they didn't. Lord, Master, speak. Your servant heareth our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.